when we discuss the greatest Canadian wrestlers of all time, we very rarely mention Rick Martel's name. True, he didn't reach the same heights as the likes of Bret Hart or Roddy Piper, but Martel was an excellent worker who I do feel doesn't get his fair due. Not only was Rick Martel more than capable in the ring, but when he was given his model character, we quickly learned that he could be incredibly entertaining in segments with the right gimmick. Martel took the model character and ran with it, the result being some seriously fun matches that are great to look back on today. To me, Rick Martel is seriously overlooked and perhaps unappreciated, but hopefully we can change that in this video as we take a look at the career of Rick Martel. Born Richard Vigneault, the French Canadian made his professional wrestling debut at the age of 16. Rick participated in amateur wrestling before making his pro debut, something that helped him quickly adopt and switch into the pro scene. Martel's debut was really down to happenstance, as another wrestler was injured and Rick's brother, Michel Mad Dog Martel, asked if he could stand in for this hurt worker. Wrestling historians would know Mad Dog Martel from Stampede Wrestling and his time in the Mercenaries tag team. Before making his way to the WWF, Rick Martel was already an accomplished, well-travelled wrestler. It seems that those who travelled around the world early in their careers turned out to be the most well-rounded superstars. Look no further than the likes of William Regal and Chris Jericho. Martel won titles in Stu Hart Stampede Wrestling, NWA All-Star Wrestling in Vancouver, and he also won belts in Japan, Puerto Rico and New Zealand, giving some instant evidence here that Rick Martel was successful very early in his career, no matter where he went. Rick needed two things to get into America and succeed. The first obviously was a work visa, and the second thing he needed was a better grasp on the English language. Rick said, I wrestled in Calgary for Stu Hart and that's where I met Kevin Sullivan. A lot of guys went to the States to wrestle and I was told that Kevin could get me to Florida. Back then you needed a visa and that was pretty hard to get. In 1975 I couldn't express myself very much. When Gordon Soley talked to me I answered yes or no and that was it. Before he could make his way to America for his first run with the WWF, tragedy struck. Michel, Rick's brother and the man who was responsible for kickstarting his career, passed away after working a show in Puerto Rico. Rick said, My brother was a big influence, a mentor. It was through him that I had many of my values transmitted. He taught me to be honest about what you do. Michel taught me to keep going. When things were going bad, I would call him up, and after he died, I didn't have that afterwards. With a heavy heart, Martel continued to follow his dream of working in the United States. In 1980, Rick was able to debut in the WWF, and his pretty boy looks and in-ring ability didn't go unnoticed. He began working in singles, but towards the end of the year, he teamed up with Tony Guerrilla to defeat the Wild Samoans for the WWF tag titles. Martel and Guerrilla would drop and regain the titles during matches with the Wild Samoans during 1981. However, the team ended up losing the titles to Mr. Fuji and Mr. Saito and were unsuccessful in recapturing the belts in the rematches that followed. Martel then decided to sign with the AWA in 1982. Martel became a highlight during his initial years in the AWA, putting on good matches while slowly rising up the ranks. The hard work paid off, as in May in 1984, Martel was able to capture the AWA heavyweight title. Not only did Martel capture the gold, but he held onto the belt for over a year and a half, defending the title against names like Nick Bockwinkle, Bob Backlund, Jimmy Carvin, Larry Zabisco and Michael Hayes. In October of 1985, the NWA World Champion Ric Flair wrestled the AWA Champion Rick Martel in Tokyo during an All Japan show. The match went on for around 35 minutes, ending in a double countout. Eventually, Martel dropped the title to Stan Hansen in December of 1985. Martel left the AWA to work for International Wrestling, or Lutte Internationale, in Quebec before making his WWF return on the 20th of October 1986. 
Martel was paired with Tom Zenk and the two formed the Can-Am Connection. The tag team worked a few TV dates in October and November before going off to All Japan to work in the AJPW Real World Tag League. The duo made their return to the World Wrestling Federation in January of 1987, beginning a near 8 year run for Rick Martel with the WWF. The Can-Am connection were portrayed as pretty boy baby faces, capable of quick and fast paced matches that caught the attention of viewers, quickly becoming fan favourites in the World Wrestling Federation. The team opened up WrestleMania 3, defeating Don Morocco and Bob Orton to kickstart the historic show. After WrestleMania, the pair became regulars on the house show loop and they even had WWF tag team title shots against the Hart Foundation on two separate occasions, however these were dark matches that never aired on TV. It's been reported that the Can-Am connection were getting prepared to become the WWF's top babyface tag team and looking at their match history on house shows and these dark matches against the Hart Foundation, it looks like an accurate report. However, a pay dispute led to Tom Zank leaving the WWF. Tom believed that Martel was making more money than he was, a statement that Martel still denies. Tom would return to Japan, have a stint in the AWA and eventually he went to WCW and became the Z-Man Tom Zank. Tito Santana ended up getting put with Rick after the Islanders continued to overwhelm Martel during singles matches. Santana and Martel would be known as Strike Force, seemingly a continuation of the Can-Am connection as the gimmick was very similar, even keeping the same theme music. The two again portrayed pretty boys who could have high energy matches and as a result they also became fan favourites. More so, Strike Force done something that the Can-Am connection could not do and that was winning the tag titles. During an episode of Superstars, Strike Force defeated the Hart Foundation to capture the belts but at WrestleMania 4, Strike Force dropped the titles to demolition. Shortly afterwards, Martel was written off TV and given 6 months off to look after his sick wife at home. When Rick Martel returned, Strike Force was reunited and the pair faced the Brain Busters at WrestleMania 5. Santana hit Martel with his flying forearm accidentally, leading to Martel refusing the tag in and walking away from the match. In an interview segment afterwards, Martel officially broke up Strike Force, saying that Tito Santana was riding the coattails of Rick Martel. We talk frequently about heel turns at WrestleMania, from Bret Hart at WrestleMania 13, Triple H at Mania 15, to Steve Austin at Mania 17, but no one ever talks about the heartache of Strike Force breaking up. So Rick was now heel and feuding with Tito Santana. By the end of 1989, Rick developed his model gimmick and I really do think that Rick's time as the model allowed him to showcase some of his best work. He wrapped up his feud with Santana at the Survivor Series, eliminating Tito in their Survivor Series tag match and he also introduced his very own brand of cologne named Arrogance. I mean, looking back at this, it was fantastic stuff. The model Rick Martel, a vain and self-centered wrestler who had his own cologne called Arrogance that he would spray on the eyes of his opponents. We couldn't stand this guy when we were younger but looking back it was brilliant heel work. His accent too worked really well for this new heel character and I just feel that his true calling was being this narcissistic bad guy in wrestling. The model Rick Martel marched into WrestleMania 6 and made quick work of Coco Beware. From here, the model went on to feud with Jake Roberts in what was a very memorable rivalry at the time. Rick had blinded Roberts with his arrogance, resulting in both men leading teams into the 1990 Survivor Series. Martel's Visionaries team, consisting of Rick, Power and Glory and the Warlord, were able to destroy the Vipers, consisting of Roberts, Jimmy Snuka and the Rockers, in a clean 4 to nothing sweep. Back then, the survivors of all Survivor Series matches on the night would meet in the main event for a giant heel vs babyface match of survival. The Visionaries teamed up with Ted DiBiase to face the Ultimate Warrior, Hulk Hogan and Tito Santana. Martel comically got himself counted out after taking beatings from Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior. 
The Martel vs Roberts feud continued into the 1991 Royal Rumble where Rick eliminated Roberts and also survived in the Rumble match for 53 minutes, a record at the time. However, at WrestleMania 7, Martel and Roberts were booked into a blindfold match, which Jake won. I can't recommend this match at all, it's bad. This was possible when we were younger, it was different for sure, but looking back now, yeah, give it a hard pass. After WrestleMania, Rick Martel was used during the WWF's partnership with Super World of Sports in Japan, and he spent most of his time here in Japan representing the World Wrestling Federation. Rick came back to the WWF just in time for the 1992 Royal Rumble, and as a quick side note, this is one of the best Royal Rumble matches you will ever see. It was jam packed with superstars such as Roddy Piper, Shawn Michaels, Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Ted DiBiase, The Undertaker, and eventual winner Ric Flair. Martel then went to WrestleMania 8 to take a loss to Tatanka, something I covered already in the Tatanka video. Anyway, after the loss, Rick Martel worked against Kerry Von Erich on the European house show loop, and once back in the US, he worked again against old rival Tito Santana at live events, who had now been repackaged as El Matador. The summer of 1992 saw Rick Martel in one of his most memorable matches as he squared off against the heartbreak kid Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam. Martel and Michaels had been fighting over the affections of sensational Sherry leading up to this match here where neither man could punch the other in the face, a stipulation agreed by both the model and the heartbreak kid before the showdown. These two were so narcissistic that neither man wanted to ruin their faces, which is a great little heated stipulation no matter what you may think of it nowadays. It was silly, but it was also refreshing to see two heels work against each other here on a big show, something that wasn't done frequently. The match ended in a double countout and Sherry ended up staying with Shawn Michaels. After SummerSlam, Tatanka and Martel wrapped up their feud. Rick Martel stole Tatanka's sacred eagle feathers and was using them as a fashion statement, and at Survivor Series, Tatanka defeated Martel and got his feathers back. The model was left off the WrestleMania 9 card as it seemed he was now set to flounder in the lower mid card, which is baffling to me still to this day. I thought he was an incredible heel, but for whatever reason, the WWF didn't see things this way. He was hardly used in 1993 on TV, but he could be found every now and then at house shows, taking losses to the 123 Kid and Razor Ramon, among others. There seemed to be a little bit of hope in September of 93 when Razor Ramon and Martel had a match on Raw for the vacant IC title, having co won a battle royal the week prior with Razor that gave both men the right to have this match for the title, but Rick Martel came up short in the match with Razor. From here, he was shuffled back down the cards, but he did appear in a traditional Survivor Series match that year, and in 1994, he was involved in the Royal Rumble match again in January. Martel was set to appear in the 10-man tag match at WrestleMania 10 that had to be scrapped due to time constraints, but the match did happen the next night on Raw, and Martel's team won. It maybe could have helped Rick if this match, and victory, occurred at Madison Square Garden at WrestleMania 10, but it was never meant to be. Rick's final Raw match, one week later, saw him take a loss to Lex Luger, and his final WWF house show loop saw him take losses to Adam Baum, Randy Savage, and Duke the Dumpster Drosy. Rick left the WWF in July 94, though he did make a surprise entrance in the 1995 Royal Rumble match. It's been reported that Rick left due to getting his foot into the world of real estate, but he still works shows every now and then back in Quebec. When Rick Martel showed up in WCW in 1998, it was quite shocking just how good he looked. While I'm sure there were fans who shook their heads at seeing yet another ex-WWF star making their way to WCW in the late 90s, and in general, most fans just don't have fond memories of Rick in WCW, I actually looked forward to Rick Martel's matches just to see if he could still go, and he definitely could still go, but unfortunately, the model gimmick was totally gone. 
Rick Martel defeated Booker T for the WCW TV title on the February 16th episode of Nitro, but just one week later at Super Brawl 8, his comeback was cut short after a bad landing on the ring ropes tore an inside ligament in his right knee. This wasn't the only injury Martel received here, as he also fractured his leg. Rick was booked to win this match, but the finish had to be changed on the fly. Martel tried to come back on the July 13th, 98 episode of Nitro to work against Stevie Ray, ironically enough, but he suffered another injury during this match. Rick then decided it was time to hang up his boots. He had his retirement match in Hawaii at an HIWF event where he defeated the Metal Maniac. At the time this video was uploaded, Rick Martel is yet another wrestler who has not been inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. In my opinion, he is truly deserving. Rick had a great passion for professional wrestling and his model character, I feel, was very entertaining. He pulled it off well. Rick became a playable character in a few recent WWE 2K video games, so we can only hope that he and the WWE are in good terms, and maybe we will get to see that Hall of Fame induction very soon.